King Lorsan II was perceived as a rather inert king in comparison with the energetic and often dramatic reigns of his predecessors. As such, he oversaw a long period of peace, during which the realm of Vanon grew and developed. Several notable towns and cities, such as Chashtal, Perth, and Scarabray, saw themselves become cities in their own right, with populations upwards of 10 and 20,000 people. Businesses also sprang up in these regions, especially as the previously non-existent merchant class came into its own during this time of peace, centered largely in the region of Nara, previously known as Ireland. This peace lasted until the year 960, when his estranged cousin Caethol Monad, Duke of Maine, sought to press his claim on Vanon. Seeing Lorsan's peaceful, idle nature made him a target. However, his claim went unpressed as he was unable to garner any support for this endeavor. And so, while nothing came of his cousin's threats, it inspired King Lorsan II to make his name known as a feared conqueror, if only to protect himself and his people from those who sought to take advantage of his nature. After defeating two independent counties in the south, a change was seen in him, as though something dark was awakened in his blood, the inheritance of his brutal forebears. Soon enough, he was given the moniker of the Cruel for how he disposed of those who resisted him. He was a particular enthusiast of drowning, and instead of ransoming prisoners, he would personally drown them in the sea, letting their bodies float away. King Lorsan the Cruel then set his sights upon the Duchy of Kent, specifically the holdings of Cumberland and Durham, seeing as Kent was becoming especially powerful in the south and would soon rival Vanon itself. Some, however, thought that this war, which promised to be one of the bloodiest yet, was mostly to satisfy the king's newfound pleasure in bloodshed. The war dragged on for six years, typified by the Battle of the Loch, where two 10,000-man armies tore each other to shreds, Lorsan himself even killing the Duke of Kent in battle. However, even after all of this, they would not yield. A white peace was eventually called, and the two duchies remained under the control of Kent. Everybody was disappointed, save for Lorsan II, as he was exhilarated in the practice of bloodshed. The next few years would see trouble brewing with various factions at court, some of which would grow to resent King Lorsan the Cruel. Most dangerous among these was the Independence faction headed by his own brother Rowan Monad, which wanted to see the Kingdom of Alba given to him. Lorsan, having caught wind of this, began a plot to kill his brother and thus Rowan died when he fell from a balcony, which had a faulty banister. To most, this was a tragic accident, but to those who wished for the stability of Venom, this was a purposeful and subtle victory. In the ensuing years, a cluster of small and weak duchies to Venom south were conquered, and all was going smoothly until the King of Essex, King Deeprex Davison, granted the Teutonic Order the counties of the West Riding and the East Riding to help them defend against the pagan kingdom of Jorvik, a newcomer to the region. With this sizable duchy right on its southern border, the Teutonic Order would prove to be a thorn in the side of Vanon kings for a long time to come. The fact that they essentially blocked any possibility for further southern conquest led to King Lorsan growing restless. As a result, in the year 969, King Lorsan the Cruel fabricated a claim on the small county of Langer, owned by a duke on the mainland. What should have been a small war escalated into a bitter conflict in mainland Europe, where the Duke of Langer was killed in battle by King Lorsan. When the new Duke of Langer, now called Lunecaster, rose to the throne, he too encountered King Lorsan the Cruel in combat. A flesh wound sustained from the last battle Lorsan fought would weaken him enough so that he could not effectively fight his enemy. King Lorsan II, known as the Cruel, died in battle against Count Leofwin of Lunecaster on the 11th of August, 970, at the age of 49. A violent man, he was regardless popular with the nobility, which became more robust under his rule, and were endeared to him as a king whose rule struck an early balance between prosperous buildup and bloody conquest. King Grimmer II rose to the throne at the age of 23, inheriting his father's war against Lunecaster, now more of a blood feud than a proper war. Lunecaster would be defeated by the end of the year, albeit not without two costly defeats at the hands of their well-led army. 
There were those in the kingdom who, still mourning his father's death, were particularly bitter about Grimmer II's rule. Some doubted his ability to rule well, pointing to his apparent lack of an heir as a possible sign of impotence. Certain factions used his initial unpopularity to further their rhetoric, especially those who would rather see the Kingdom of Alba become independent. On the 9th of July, 971, these traitors, who began their plot under Lorsan the Cruel, would strike, led by his cousin, Ian Monad. As such, King Grimmer II was named a pretender upon the throne of Alba. Poetically, King Grimmer II had to face the same trial as his grandfather, for who he was named. His levies were matched by those the rebels could muster, so he had to hire a force of 9,000 men to outnumber them. However, even with this handicap, the king was an adaptive man. He knew that with the use of the ships that sent his men to fight Looncaster, he could be certain that he could reach Alba faster than he could by foot. If he could get there faster, he could fight the Risen armies before they united, and he could put down the rebellion. The entire fleet met at Trashtoll where the mercenaries were waiting. First, they landed in southern Alba and fought a force of 1,900 men, leaving the other, smaller armies for loyal vassals to fight, then immediately sailing off to the Kingdom of Nara to fight the second rebel band of 1,900 men in the south of the island near Cork. After several days of fighting, he won that battle, and he marched his army east to Kildare where the rebels had planted their flag, making it their de facto capital. As the army approached, it soon became clear that there were no soldiers inside, and so the Crown Army marched right in. While King Grimmer II would crush the rebellion in 973, he would do so at great expense spending a fourth of the kingdom's wealth over the course of the war. The ensuing years would be spent trying to recover and maintain the kingdom's prosperity, as nearly all of the gains made during the early part of his father's rule were dearly affected by these many years of continuous conflict. In the year 981, King Grimmer II changed the succession laws to further ensure the security of the throne and the security of his bloodline, enacting the Agnatic Cognatic Succession Law, allowing women to inherit on the condition that there are no eligible men to inherit. This decision was influenced by the fact that King Grimmer II, at 34, still had no sons at the time. In the same year, Pope Hadrianus II called the Second Crusade, this time for the Emirate of Bergamo in the Alps, made up of Berber pirates who recently invaded the area. In 983, the Crusade was successful and the Kingdom of Lombardy was founded. A pious Catholic, King Grimmer II received this news with great joy. This celebration would be short-lived, however. King Grimmer II died on the 25th of January, 985, at the age of 38, when he was assassinated in his sleep by Duke Henri the Young, a member of a Lunecaster cadet house. Grimmer's day's old son, Lorsan III, then inherited the throne. Upon attempting to arrest Duke Henri for the regicide of King Grimmer II, the Duke raised his flag in rebellion against the infant king. The war would be bitter but short, and his father's death would be avenged the next year, when Duke Henri the Young was executed while in prison. This horrible misfortune at the very start of his life and reign would earn young Lorsan the moniker of the Black. His tutors and courtiers, to whom it would fall to raise the boy, noted various things about the royal orphan. Namely, he was withdrawn, and he did not speak a word until the age of four. He did not have many friends, and it seemed he had no idea how to navigate normal interactions with people, especially other children. The sight of him was a sight of sorrow, and as such he was not often sought out. The court chaplain, known as Brother Fairfarenx, was the only member of court which felt to him like real family. And so, the first eight years of his rule would be terribly uneventful, and while not a period of growth, it was mercifully a period of peace. <laughs>